this most blessed Easter morning, we will be considering the account of Jesus' resurrection from the perspective of John's Gospel, where it is recorded in the 20th chapter. Now, this morning's sermon may come across in its format a little more like a Bible study than a sermon, and as much as I would like to examine this rich but also often read text section by section. So we begin then with the first two verses of chapter 20. Early, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary has come upon a terrible scene. Imagine, if you would, going to the grave of a recently buried friend, expecting that you might have a time of personal mourning and quiet contemplation, only to arrive and discover the grave empty, the casket removed from the grave and left open along the side. Horrifying and gruesome. Your reaction? Uh, possibly anything from anger to disgust to fear. The closest I have personally come to this is the occasional situation where a hospital temporarily misplaces a body. Fortunately, that doesn't happen often, but I have seen it happen, and though the situation is almost always quickly resolved, it is typically painful and nerve-wracking for the loved ones. This is perhaps something like what Mary Magdalene experienced at that point. It seems she believes Jesus has been misplaced. The irony, of course, is that, in fact, she and all the disciples have misplaced Jesus, for they still did not understand. They somehow managed to misplace his words, that he must suffer and die, but that death would not be the end. No wonder, as we might read in Luke's account, Mary looked for the one who was alive among the abode of the dead. How much more in our world do we misplace Jesus? We look for him in creeds and man-made rules. We believe that perhaps we will find him in the hallowed halls inhabited by the just and the right, when in fact Jesus is to be found wherever God's children are oppressed, whenever the strong make victims of the weak. There we will find Jesus standing before Pilate or under the whip of the Roman guard. But even more than that, we will find him raised whenever and wherever human beings carry out his mandate to love each other, even as he loved them, even in the tiny, seemingly insignificant moments of an average day, we find Jesus in a kind word, in an act of forgiveness, where an unselfish, utterly undeserved act of mercy takes place. Indeed, there we will find the risen Christ. Reading onward, verses 3 through 10. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. It seems that when Mary told Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that of course would be John, they 
entered into a foot race. There may be something to the fact that John and Peter are, in the fourth gospel, often set up as a kind of foil to one another. Peter denies Jesus, while John remains with the women at the cross, to the very bitter end. John has a place of honor and even intimacy sitting next to Jesus at the table during the Last Supper, while Peter, it seems, is given the role of prompting Jesus to predict his denial. There may be nothing to this, or nothing of any great importance, or we may, given the fourth gospel's attention to and focus on theological detail, look at this particular incident as indicative of something reflective of our own reactions to the news of Jesus' resurrection. It is Easter Sunday, one of the days when churches across the world really fill up. Shouts, or at least statements of, He is risen, Alleluia, are heard from every corner this morning. How many people race to church, not wanting to be late, not wanting to get a bad seat, which in church, ironically enough, tend to be unlike at sporting events with seats in the front. Peter and John raced, it seems, and John, perhaps because he was younger or more agile, outpaced Peter. But he waited for Peter to get there and allowed Peter to enter the tomb first before he did so himself. This might have been a gesture of respect for the older man, or it might have been fear. I'm not going in there alone, although I doubt that, given the picture of John that this fourth gospel paints. But then, how like us are those two disciples? How like Christians of our day and age, with our innumerable denominations and divisions, racing towards something, and perhaps like John, peeking shyly at a truth, perhaps not wanting to get too close. Or like Peter, rushing in without understanding what has truly happened. It is John, we are told, that saw and believed when he finally did enter the tomb after Peter. John is able to make some sense of the bizarre situation, beginning to understand the true nature of Jesus. What does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? Can we make sense of it? Are we willing to go inside and take a really close look? Does that change anything? Having seen the empty tomb and the discarded grave accoutrements of death, are we ourselves any different than before? Continuing on to verses 11 through 13, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. While our text would have us understand that John now believes, he has some inkling of belief, an understanding that his Jesus is not dead. But Mary, she is still grieving. Mary is experiencing the one thing that we might say, beyond any shadow of doubt, unites us all. She is mourning the loss of someone she loved. Who among us has lived more than a few years on this planet and does not know what it is like to lose someone we love. In the words of an old blues song, death don't got no mercy. We live in a world that is defined by death. And while we may try to ignore it, marginalize it, sanitize it, it is still all around us. 
So much so that we have learned to make entertainment out of death, death both fictional and real. We even make business out of death. It is inescapable. One might imagine that we would, between the news and the entertainment industry, and the very inevitability, be somehow inured, hardened to it. And yet, quoting a relatively recent hymn, Still in grief, we mourn our dead. But that is all about to change. Now, I'm not going to weave a discussion of human resurrection, our resurrection, into this story about Jesus. For John's Gospel in no way does that. Instead, I will suggest that the defeat of death by one man is a game-changer for the human race, a mark of hope, an indication that the world, Jesus, and God the Father, and you and I, are all something far bigger and more wondrous than we can imagine. A reality that Mary is about to encounter as we move on to verses 14 through 16. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary sees Jesus, but she doesn't know it's him. Now some might blame the poor light, for it is still very early in the morning. Some blame Mary's tear-obstructed vision. Perhaps her head is even still in her hands as she weeps, and she has only caught a glimpse of movement, knowing someone is there. She believes it's the gardener. Borrowing a thought from the excellent Lutheran preacher and blogger, Paul Neusterlein, I would suggest that this particular detail is not accidental. Mary wonders if Jesus is the gardener, and while that's clearly not all he is, he does not deny the fact, for Jesus is a gardener, the chief gardener of a new garden that is being planted. If Adam and Eve represent the primitive infancy of humanity, or perhaps I shall say pre-humanity, those, we still, in some ways, who spoil the garden with our greed, our selfishness, our immature lack of love, then perhaps Jesus, standing there with Mary Magdalene, represent humanity as God is making it, tenders of the new garden, who will ultimately be fostered by selfless love and acts of mercy. And, of course, it is when he speaks her name that she understands. For Jesus calls each of us by name in the right place and time and in the right way, so that we may know him for who he truly is. How is Jesus calling you today? And in what guise will you find him? Now, reading still further, in John's resurrection account, Verses 17 and 18. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that he had said to her. Imagine, if you will, Mary's emotional roller coaster. First, her friend, her beloved teacher, verily her savior, 
the one who brought meaning to her life is, she believed, dead. Executed for crimes he did not commit. And then to believe that even in death he could find no peace. His body stolen or callously carted off. Then beyond all hope, to discover that he is alive, right there before her. And then to hear him say, don't hold on to me. But it does make sense. After a moment, it surely must have made sense to Mary, particularly in light of what Jesus says next. How much does the church turn Easter into a story about hope for life after death, or perhaps resurrection after life after death? But again, John does not, as they say, even go there. John leaves the business of the next life for others to contemplate. For John's concern, and if we take this gospel seriously, Jesus' concern as well is not, lo, he is risen, now you will be too. But rather, lo, he is risen, now there is work to do. Mary, don't hold on to me. I'm going to my father, your father too, my sister. The implication is that she too shall return to the Father some day, for Jesus has elevated her to the status of sister, even as the disciples are elevated to the state of brothers. But now, Mary, you, yes, even you, a woman, go tell my brothers. The fact that in first century Jewish culture, a woman's testimony was essentially meaningless is not lost on the authors of John, nor was it lost on Jesus. For surely he was saying to Mary, Yes, you are important. We are all important, the brothers and the sisters. We all have work to do. You and they and I, who will live in you, will build the new garden, build the new kingdom, the place where, in the words of the 25th chapter of Isaiah, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken, and that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Mm -hmm.